Let's speak the name of Jesus. Wonderful song. I'm just going to open in prayer. Jesus, we, we speak your name over this church. Lord, we speak your name over this message that you want me to share. We speak your name over every person that is listening. Speak your precious name over Barb as she ministers to our children. And we speak Jesus over all the children down there. When we speak your name, Lord Jesus, over the rest of this day. But I ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would guide me in this message, that you would connect the dots like only you can do, that you would bring it into every heart and every mind, that message that you put on my heart. And I just ask you to help me, even help me with the language, everything in Jesus' name. Amen. Who enjoyed last Sunday? Who was here? And who did, wasn't that powerful? I thought it was so amazing when uh, the presence of the Lord showed up at the end and I opened my eyes and I seen not one but many, many faces where tears were ro rolling down their cheeks. And it's not about the emotion, but you see, when Jesus comes, he touches our spirit, but our our body and our soul will always respond. Does that make sense? So it starts in the spirit. That's where it's supposed to start in our, in our spirit man. That's what is touched. But our soul and our body will respond. It shouldn't start in the emotion and get pushed into the spirit. That's what some people try and it's, it uh, remains empty. We can make decisions on emotions uh, and while the emotion is there, we can stand on it. And when the emotions leave, and when the emotions leave, we lose our ground. That's why it's so important when you get married that you don't make the decision based on your emotions, but based on knowing that that person is the spouse that God wanted you to marry. Because when you go back, when time, when things get tough, and in marriage things get tough at times. You don't look back on the emotion, you look back on God made it real to me that this was supposed to be my spouse. And I stand on that. Amen? Amen. Um, today, I'm going to speak about hope. The, tech, the, the title of the message is, Don't Lose Hope. And I was really, really blessed by this myself. Um, like every time, when I prepare a message, I, I am blessed while preparing it. Um, we have talked about love last week. Powerful. But what about hope? Let's turn to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13.13. 13. It's a very popular verse. Many preachers, rightfully so, will preach about love. A lot about love, which is granted and which is very good and needed. And a lot of preachers will preach about faith, which is also very, very important and definitely needed. But not often, including myself, have I heard about hope. But here in Corinthians, verse 13, it says, And now abide faith, hope, and love, these three but the greatest of these is love. So once again, those three things, faith, hope, and love, are crucial to us Christians, are absolutely important. Now the greatest is love. Why is love the greatest? Because it's only because of his love that we are saved. It's only because of his love that he went to the cross for us. It's only in our love relationship with Jesus that we're going to go to heaven. He is the way, the truth, and the life. But faith gets preached a lot as well. Put your faith in Christ. We're justified, justified by faith. So what about hope? What is hope actually? What is biblical hope versus what is carnal hope or hope in this world? And this is really exciting. Um, really to explain hope, I'm going to... I'm going to start explaining what is faith. Because I believe when we understand what faith is, we actually will understand what hope is. 
And the word faith, and I don't want to go too deep into theology. I don't, I'm not a big fan of theology. I like practical things that actually change a person's life. That's what I'm after. But if I look at the Hebrew word for faith, it really opened my understanding in a better way. The Hebrew word for faith is imunah. Imunah means really faith requires an action. That word implies it's not just a state of mind, a state of heart. It actually, in the Hebrew root, it requires action. And that's the first key for faith. If faith does not have action, it's not faith. We all know this. James 2.17 says, Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, it is dead. So it requires us to do something, either in our thought life or with our actions. Now, emunah also shares the root of the word amen. So be it. Another big key. So we have action and we have amen. After every prayer we say amen. And sometimes we forget how important the amen is. Because by saying amen we say so be it. We actually saying I have faith for this. So it's important that the Holy Spirit guides you in your prayer. Because the Holy Spirit is the one that releases faith within us. So if it's just an empty amen, perhaps that is a signal of, do I actually have faith for this? And if I don't have faith for it, I need faith for this because I just prayed this. So then I ask the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, let's try this again. I believe that often the Holy Spirit will actually guide us to pray for a person. I know a lot of people here have experienced this. You, you're driving down the road and you're thinking about somebody suddenly, and you get this burden inside where the Holy Spirit is nudging you and says, please pray for this person. The moment he urges you to do that, that releases faith, because it didn't come from yourself. So you know, okay, God just talked to me to talk about, to pray for this person, so he actually has given me power, faith, to pray for them. So you see your, your prayer actually changes in that moment. But now sometimes we have things that God doesn't put on our hearts and we want to pray for, we need the Holy Spirit to release that faith, to say, Amen, so be it. No doubt. Faith has no doubt in it. I'm going to go deeper into this. Now, Imuna also shares the root with Iman, which means to confirm it. Once again, it's very strong. In faith, there is no weakness. There is no perhaps. There is no maybe. It either is or it isn't. Amen, so be it to confirm it, action. Imuna also shares the root with amana, which means covenant. I'm going to go deeper into that. Last one that it shares the root with is haimen, which means to confide. Confirmation, once again, an assurance. So that is really what faith is. There's no doubting in faith. So, hope, certainly different than faith. Now, ha'amin can also mean to trust. Now, this is where people, where now people think, okay, trust and faith are the same thing. They're, they're very, very similar, but they're not the same. In the Greek, the word for faith and trust is the same, but in Hebrew it isn't. Now, trust, remember I just said covenant, Trust goes back to the covenant. Trust is the bowed relationship. Faith is about action. Hebrews 1.11. This verse describes faith the absolute best, in my opinion. It says, Now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance in what we do not see. The confidence in what we hope for. So once again, there's no maybe in faith. There's only going to happen. Now in my life, there have been numerous moments 
and I, I'm sure many people can relate, where God gave me faith, and there was zero doubt that it was, would, wouldn't happen. Now, I had many moments where I had hope, and I hoped something would happen as well. I remember when God said, go to America, or when God said, apply for the pastor position in Lakeview, the moment that he said it, and I'm not saying, and this is where people sometimes say, well, that's arrogant or that's prideful. The moment he said to apply for the pastor, I had the faith that that was his will and it's going to happen. There was zero doubt in the entire process. Not because I thought I would be such a great candidate. Candidate. Most people that knew me actually didn't think I should be a pastor. Maybe I shouldn't say this. But <laughs> I knew in the bottom of my heart, see, it has not, not much to do with the mind. It's really in your heart. God had spoken, and it's going to happen. He will give you actually a taste of victory before you have the victory. That's what faith is. It's the confidence in hope. It's the assurance in things that are not seen. Why do I talk about faith? Because it will really help us later to understand hope and how vital hope is. See, right now you think, well, yeah, I get, you know, love. Yeah, that's definitely important. And that confidence that you're talking about, that's really important too. Hope seems really odd in that context. Hope? What is hope? Let's go a little bit deeper and I'll come back to the hope. But the confidence in our faith in God, that is a long-term faith that we have. The moment that we say yes to Jesus, we have this faith inside. And that stays. That should always stay. It's every day, in and day out. Now, what are these bursts of faith? What are these bursts of faith? The best way to describe it is North Dakotans really know wind. And I'm really done with the wind in North Dakota. <laughs> you know, it's one thing if it's cold, but it's another thing if it's cold and windy. Because then it's so cold you can't go coyote hunting. You stand out there and you're just freezing. Your coyote call doesn't even work because the wind is so strong the coyotes don't hear it. Anyway, the wind is pretty annoying. Even when it doesn't snow, it still blows the snow, okay? You get the point. Now, faith is a constant wind, okay? The moment we put our faith in Jesus, we are just, justified by faith, there's this wind in our life. And this is a good wind. This is not the North Dakota wind. This is the good wind. But every once in a while, there's a gust of wind. And suddenly, instead of 20 miles, it's 50 miles an hour. Those are the moments that you look back on your life when that person got healed, that person got saved, that financial miracle came. And it's almost as the Holy Spirit turns up the temperature a bit, or I guess the, turns up the, the fan a bit, and you get a gust of wind, and suddenly you have a breakthrough. Just what we're saying about you have a breakthrough when you speak the name of Jesus. So in your life should be the constant wind that drives you towards heaven. But within it, there should hopefully be a lot of gusts of faith. And it should always come back, doesn't go below, should always come back on that, on that level. That's how I understand faith. Now, really important to understand, faith is in the heart, it's not in the mind. And we'll get back to that. Now, you say, well, now you mentioned trust, now I'm a bit confused. Let me get into that. Faith is about action. It's the confidence that something is going to happen, that we're going to heaven, that Jesus is the Son of God, that that person is going to be healed, that God's will will be done in our lives. That's faith in action. That is confidence. Now, trust is all about relationship. It goes back to the word covenant in Hebrew, relationship. With trust comes almost a feeling of vulnerability. That feeling is not there with faith. It really isn't because it's all about action. You might even say it's all about business. There's not much emotion in faith. It is a confidence that something is going to happen. However, with trust, there is somewhat of a vulnerability there. It it's kind of goes in a little bit in a different direction, doesn't it? The best way I found, I thought about this, how do you to explain this better? 
Let's think about our marriages, okay? Any, anyone that is married or in a relationship. Faith, I have been faithful to my spouse. That is an action. Not even now just sexually, but with everything that I do, I promise that I will be there, and I day by day make that decision, that action to, of being there. Now, sometimes, obviously, we fail and, and, and whatnot, but... Generally speaking, that is the faith in action, okay? I have been faithful. Even the act of marriage, when we're going to get married, that is actually an act of faith and saying, okay, God, this is the person for my life. I'm going to step out and do that. That's faith. Now, trust is way more about I trust my spouse. I trust him that he won't hurt me. I trust her and give her my heart. Same with Jesus, isn't it? When we say, Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God, that's faith. When we trust Jesus, we trust that he's going to hold us, that he's going to have grace, that he's going to have mercy. We put ourselves out there. We put ourselves out there in something that we don't see. That is also trust. But in a relationship, it's probably perhaps better explained with a spouse. You trust that your spouse is going to be faithful. The other spouse trusts that the other spouse is going to be faithful. So there's a, you put yourself out there. So when God says go to Africa, the act of going is faith. But it's also trust. You see? It's also trust that he'll take care of you, that he'll provide. That's where the trust comes in. Not to confuse you. Faith is action. Okay, just remember, faith is action. Trust is more about relationship. But they are very close. They are very close together. Because in a way, when you trust your spouse, you put faith in them. Right? It's just that that can hurt you a lot more than the action of faith. Okay. I think I made it clear. Now, there's another word. And I'm sorry, I really don't want to confuse you. But sometimes we get all these words mixed up. So we had... Faith, I, I hope I explained that. We had trust. Now we have belief. What is belief? I'm just going to do a quick one. Believe in God means belief is actually faith and trust combined. Why do I say that? In Matthew 21, 21, I'm just going to read this. You don't have to turn there. If you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. See, that is faith. That fig tree didn't produce fruit, and Jesus cursed it and was withered, and he says to the disciples, and they were, they were blown away, blown away by that gust of wind, you see. Uh, they said, man, this is amazing. And he said, well, if you have faith, this action of making this fig tree die, you can speak to a mountain and it will be cast into the sea. See, that's faith. Now, what is belief? Well, what's belief is when we go to Mark 1.15 and it says, and we all know this one, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe into the gospel. See, he didn't say have faith into the gospel. He said believe into the gospel. Why believe? Because we put our faith in Christ and our trust at the same time. Our life changes. You see, we give our faith to Christ and we give him also our heart, which is all about relationship. So belief is nothing but trust and faith combined. So if I believe in Jesus, I say I have faith in him. I have faith that he's the son of God. I have faith that he died for me on the cross. And I trust in him. I trust that he loves me. I trust that he takes care of me. I trust that he has a good plan for my life. So that's belief. Okay? Now we're going to go to hope. And hope is really powerful. And it's a lot more powerful than I would have ever thought and ever thought about. And I've never heard anyone really speak a lot about it. You know, I always thought hope is going to be like, you know, yeah, I hope that's going to happen. And it was almost like, it's very unlikely that this is going to happen, but I hope it's going to happen. Or some people say, well, hope for the best, plan for the worst. You know? 
So what does hope do in that context of faith and love? It seems so, I don't know. It, do, it seems like it doesn't compare. Let's turn, actually, yeah, let's turn to Isaiah 40, 31. Now you might wonder, where is hope in that famous, famous verse? We all know it by heart. It's one of my favorite verses. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall, shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Where's hope in that? I'm actually going to show you that the actual word hope is in that, but it's actually a matter of translation. If we look at the word hope in the Hebrew, there are two words. One is tikva, and the other one is yachal. You see, with my German accent, I can actually say some things that you English-speaking people can't. And it actually makes me really happy, because this th kind of thing, you know, drives me wild sometimes. But when it comes to Hebrew, I can do all the sounds I want because it exists in German and in Dutch. So yachal and tikva, sorry, I had to throw that in there. It does make me happy. Uh, are two words that describe hope. Now, what is hope? I, say, I asked that question earlier. And I, I wrote up a sentence here and I said, what we are hoping for is always good, but we don't necessarily receive the desired or hoped for outcome. That's really what hope is. And once again, you wonder, what has that to do in the Bible? Isn't that a sign of weakness? Isn't that a sign of not having faith? Isn't that a sign of that? Not understanding God's love? Why would we have hope? Now, this was the part of my study where I felt the presence of the Lord and I have to confess I started weeping because if you go into the meaning of these words and I just ask everyone to reflect this as I read them you actually come to the essence of what hope is and how important it is the so first one what it means is to wait continually to wait continually in the Hebrew, the root of the words, tikva and yachal, is to wait continually. The next one is to wait in silence and in stillness. To wait in silence and in stillness. The next one is to wait and endure. To wait and endure. The next one is to look expectantly, expecting a good outcome. To look expectantly. Next one is similar again. To wait and to stand firm is hope. And now, this one perhaps describes it the best. The Hebrew word can mean rope, as a rope that you pull on, or cord. Now you wonder, what has that to do with hope? To hang on him. I want you to envision a cliff, and you're hanging on a little rope, or big rope, but you're hanging down that cliff, and there's no way for you to climb up the rope is not a safety, you know, when you watch these mountain climbers. Uh, they climb and then when they make a wrong step, they fall and there's the safety rope. That's not what it is. Envision yourself hanging on that rope and there's full tension on that rope the whole time. 
That's what the Hebrew word means for hope. So your whole reliance, everything that you hang on is one cord, one hope. And at the top, Jesus stands and is holding that hope, rope. So at the top is the source of your hope that you are connected to through your faith, through your love, through your relationship and trust, you are connected. But you're just hoping the whole time that that rope doesn't tear. That's your only thought at that moment. You don't think about your bank account. You don't think about Sunday dinner. You just think about that rope and you say, I hope this rope will hold. That's what you're thinking. That's what I would be thinking. And another way to describe it, and it's all these Words, these Hebrew words in the Old Testament, when these, when these situations happened, they used them in different situations. So that's where I'm pulling them from. And one of them was also, and all the mothers in this room will understand this one really well, and the fathers who were standing besides the, besides the bed, being in labor, in waiting, in painful expectation. We husbands stand there and we hope and we every, that the baby that comes out is healthy, that the mom will be okay. Well, the mom is laying there and she's expecting that baby, but painfully expecting. That is the core of the Hebrew words hope. And that certainly puts it in a bit of a different light, perhaps. That's what really helped me to explain what is God after in this? What is hope all about? To painfully expect, perhaps even painfully endure. Lamentations, when you read the lamentations, one message goes through that whole book in the Bible, and it's basically it says, our enemies prosper, God. Our enemies, the evil people, are prospering. And they feel that distress, they feel that pain, and they are holding on to that rope. Okay? But they have a continued hope that God will forgive them, that God will come back, that God will bless Israel again. That is the, the, the key message when you read Lamentations. And it's always, well, our enemies, they prosper. Well, maybe that sounds familiar to some of us, looking at this world, looking in our personal life, even sometimes. Say, how is it that the enemies are prospering? How is it when we see all that grief and all that pain? Or in our kids, we look at our kids or friends or family, and they perhaps have walked away or the enemy has caused a lot of destruction in their life. And we say, well, how is it that the enemy is prospering in their lives? But as a mother, as a father, as a friend, you don't want to let go of that hope. You don't want to let go of that rope for that person in your life. You will pray for them because you have hope that things will change. When we, let's turn to Romans 5, that's verse 1 to 5. I just want to explain it a bit more based on the scripture. That is Romans 5, verse 1 to 5. It says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So there it is again. We are justified by faith. Through whom also we have access by faith into this grace. So we have access by faith, by faith into his grace. In which we stand. So we stand in his grace. And rejoice 
in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. It's pretty complex what is in this verse. Let's start with having hope of the glory of God. Well, that hope, so he says rejoice, rejoice, be joyful in the hope of the glory of God. It means through your faith, through the grace, be joyful to hold on that little rope that you're going to see Jesus in his glory. That either when he comes back, that you're going to see him and worship him and he's going to take you, whatever people believe, I'm not going to get into that, but that you will see Jesus in his glory and that he will accept you, that he will redeem you from your body, from your, from your flesh. That's that one. Or if you go before, when God calls you home, that you go home and see him in heaven. That's the hope of glory. And the Bible speaks a lot about it. A lot. There are quite a few verses about the hope. It's always hope of glory. Hope of glory. Now, then he says that we should glory in tribulations. When things get hard. I think we live in a time now where we see things can change pretty quickly. People forget how evil this world can be and how quick things can change. I said to Mary yesterday, perhaps I shouldn't even say this, but I'm going to, just to explain this, I said, looking at Europe, they are not ready for what is happening in Ukraine. Just, and you might believe in military, you might not. I'm not going to go into that. But looking at their military, they are not ready at all for what is happening there. Forget about nuclear, forget about that. Russia doesn't need any of that if they choose to attack. Why am I saying that? We can see how quickly things can turn. We, we certainly have, over the last three years, and especially even for the younger generation, because some of the older generation have seen the Great Depression, and, and, and well, the, the, the fruits of that at least, and, and, and you know the, the Iron Curtain and, and, and things like that, the Vietnam War. The younger generation has never seen anything like that. They have been very protected. So it's very easy to not think about any of that. I and mean, certainly we shouldn't put our mind on all the negative stuff, but it's very interesting that over the last two, three years, I would assume, or I think, that everyone, even the younger kids, have had an understanding of a bit of tribulation, a bit of, we need some perseverance. Just even when, when it comes to school, masks and mandates and swimming pools are not open anymore or whatever. There comes a taste, okay? So, but this verse says, we should glory in it. Why? Remember what I said last Sunday? I said, God wants to put us into a place of uncomfort so we can become an overcomer, so we can learn how to overcome. That goes very much along with this. And then it says, the tribulation will produce what is perseverance? A spirit of an overcomer. A mindset of an overcomer. That is perseverance. To stand your course no matter what the opposition looks like. Okay, and then perseverance, character. So it strengthens our character. It makes our character more, more rounded, stronger, perhaps actually even we become more like Jesus? Is that what it's saying? I think so. So the tribulation, the perseverance, the character makes us more like him. We're never going to be exactly like him, but our desire is certainly to become like him more and more. So he says glory in that. And then he says, and become more like Jesus? 
will give you more hope. So we get a picture of hope. Now hope does not disappoint, he says. Now you're thinking, well, John, you just said earlier, you said that, that, that hope, we're always hoping for good, but we don't necessarily, necessarily receive it. But now they're saying, now hope does not disappoint. But what does he say after that? Because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts. Hope does not disappoint when it comes to love. That love is guaranteed. Hope is rooted in love. That's why it says earlier, love is the greatest out of the three. Faith and hope are both rooted in love. But in that area, hope will never disappoint. He says, I will never stop loving you. That's what he says. That's why hope does not disappoint when it comes to love. That's how I understand it. He says, no matter what, I will always love you. Because you are my child. So in this, we see that hope has to do with overcoming. And that hope is based in love. I'm going to read this verse to you, and then we're going to turn together to Romans 8, 20 to 26. Um, before that, so that's Romans, you can turn to Romans 8, 20, 26, and I'm going to read Colossians 1, 27. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ and you, the hope of glory. Once again, Christ in us is a glorious mystery. It's something that all the generations before his death and resurrection could never understand. But we have the privilege to understand Christ in us. That was impossible before his death and his resurrection. So he says, you have the glorious mystery. You have understood it. It's, it's rich in you, and it's once again... Just to point this out, it is the hope of glory, Christ in us. That relationship that is based on love and faith and trust is our rope, our hope for what is coming. You see, hope is always focused on the future. It's always what is going to come. Love is based on what he did. And that stands for the future. It stands for eternity. But hope is always looking forward. We always expect. So there's again the hope of glory. But when we look at Romans 8.20, and I, I know I'm giving you a lot of scripture, but sometimes I have to, and I like to do that. I'm just going to read this together with you. It starts in verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility. Futility means uselessness. No, no reason, no, no point. So the creation was subjected to uselessness, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Creation, he's talking about the animals. He's talking about all creation, but specifically about the animals. You see that in a second. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption, of sin, into glorious liberty of the children of God. So with us Christians who believe in Jesus, all creation will also be delivered from that fall of Adam because they were living with Adam in the paradise and there was no killing and no bloodshed, but they have been under that bondage of sin along with us. And it says they are waiting for that. It says... In verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. There it is again, the labor pains. So he says creation, all the animals, when you look outside, you see a deer or a rabbit or a horse or a cow, is actually painfully waiting for Jesus to come back. When you look at animals, think about that next time. When you look at your dog that lays in the yard, there's just an animal, but inside of that animal, there's, he's waiting for Jesus to come back. That's what it says. Painfully waiting like a woman at birth. 
And not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption and the redemption of our body. And once again, we are hoping for that glory. We are hoping to meet Jesus. For we, and now, this come, now the, the big surprise comes, for we are saved in this hope. Wait a second. He doesn't say we are saved in faith. He doesn't say we are saved in love. But he says we are saved in this hope. He said, John, what are you trying to tell me? Going to preach a new gospel to me. It certainly challenged me. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does still why does one still hope for what he sees? So he's saying it has to be unseen. It has to be in the future. We cannot see it. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. And once again, there's the overcomer. So he says, hope actually is what makes us an overcomer. Without the attitude of hope, we cannot persevere. That's what he's saying. And maybe that's what some people here have to hear. Maybe you're facing something in your life that is looking like there is no way out. How am I going to come out of this situation? Where is my future? Where is the light at the end of the tunnel? He says, one thing you need more than other, any other thing is to have hope. If you don't have hope, then there's no overcoming. And you're not saved, he says. We are saved in hope. When the Jews were captured by the, by the Nazis all over Europe, imagine what they felt like. And it's a little bit of a picture to us what persecution looks like, or a lot of it. They saw this superpower that was conquering nations like Poland in 20 days, and France fell, Italy fell, well, they were allies, and then they fell. Norway, Sweden, Netherlands, Belgium, all the East Bloc, all fell. And then these hands of these people, evil people. I think the ones that made it through it were the ones that had hope. Certainly, I would think a higher percentage of the people that had hope made it through it. Obviously, they were in the hands of evil people, and they could do whatever they want. But the people that stayed strong in here were the people that had hope. That had hope that something will happen, that God will come and stop them. And he did. And maybe some people in this room, in your personal life, or even when it comes to salvation or your relationship with Jesus, maybe even have lost hope. Or maybe there's something that is going on under the surface where you have lost hope. Well, today is for those people and everyone else to understand hope and to appreciate it. But it's really for anyone that maybe has given up on something. Maybe not all of the things in your life, but maybe a few things. Where year after year, it doesn't get better. You need hope. And Jesus is the one that gives us the, gives us the hope. In Thessalonians 5.8, 1 Thessalonians 5.8, it says, But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of the hope of salvation. Once again, hope and salvation. And the breastplate of faith and love, meaning the breastplate protects our heart. That's faith and hope. Uh, faith and, sorry, love. The hope is the helmet we put over our minds. You can't prevent the birds flying above your head, but you can stop them from building nests in your hair. That's what it's all about. The enemy will build a nest 
up here, full of lies, all entangled, to take away that hope. Because that hope is that rope that's your connection to what is coming. That's what the enemy does. You can't prevent him from flying around, but you can prevent him from what goes into your mind. Sherry, if you would mind to play the piano, that would be wonderful. So we understand that hope is essential for our salvation. Now I want to point to one more thing that hope does. And I think that is the key thing that we need when we face tribulation, when we live a Christian life, when we live our day-to-day -day stuff. Hope produces holy living. That's really the essence what hope does. And I'm going to explain this. If hope would become too big, like if hope would grow, it would become faith. Right? If hope, if you build on hope, it would turn into faith because faith is the evidence this is going to happen. There's no doubt. But hope leaves that little bit of what is going to happen? I'm hoping for the best. I'm hoping that my finances will be okay. I'm hoping that my kids are going to grow up and stay healthy and know Jesus personally. I'm hoping that I will meet the Master. I'm hoping that I'm going to be healed. I'm hoping, and you just fill the blank, okay? I'm hoping I'm not going to stay lonely. I'm hoping that I'm not missing my calling or what God has for my life. So you think, well, why is that there? Shouldn't we have faith in all these things? Yes, God can give us faith in whatever. But what that hope produces is inside of us a, a healthy turmoil, a rubbing. Iron sharpens iron. To get the oil out of the seed, we have to crush the seed. So what it does, it works in us holiness. It takes us away from the sin. It takes us away from the corruption. It takes us away from a lukewarm life. It takes us away from all kinds of things. Because in us, it is work, working. We're holding on to that rope. And that's why God put it there. is actually a gift. It is actually like the fear of the Lord is a gift because we will never disrespect Him. We, we know there's a line. And if you don't know that there's a line, you're going to do something very foolish. You're going to do something very sinful. You're going to do something very hurtful. So that's the fear of the Lord. The hope is very similar to that. That's how I understand it. It works within us. Just as a confirmation for the first verse, we know we talked about faith, hope, and love. The greatest is love. If you, I'm just going to read this. 1 Thessalonians 1.3 says, We remember before our God and Father. Now this is amazing, and I have never seen this. You, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So he uses these three things. And I feel the Lord when I say this. The Lord is right here. He's working on some people's hearts. And he's working on mine. This is the moment where I was completely overwhelmed. Because I said, said Lord, I don't want hope. I want faith. <laughs> I just don't want to worry about these things. I just want to be happy in faith and love and let's go. But it's a gift. Because the world is so evil around us, we need that check inside of ourselves that works. But look at this, it says, 
Work produced by faith. There it is. The action. It's all about action. Faith, action, confidence. Let's go get it done. Your labor, your actual work, would be nothing without love. Actually, you wouldn't even have thought about working because you didn't have Jesus' love. So the love of Jesus, the love of the Father, actually motivates us to work. People say it all the time. If you love what you do, you're not working anymore. But that's what really drives people, right? They love what they do. Well, that's the same for us Christians. God loves us so much, we want to work for him. So the labor is prompted by love and the work produced by faith. And then he says, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what will make us stand the test of time. And I'm talking about the most important thing is salvation. That we're going to meet the Lord and be in his glory with him. That is the most important thing. And to let that hope work in your life. Don't reject it, but let it work. Welcome it. But then I'm also talking, besides the salvation, which is the most important thing, I know that there are people here that are in situations in their life where they need hope, where they have lost hope. And I just want you to think about that. Is there something in my life where the hope of glory, the hope of Jesus going to work it out, the, to see Jesus work that problem out, is there that hope, is that lost? Has it been too long? Has it been too many years? Has it, be, hasn't, has it been too many months where that hope is gone? Where the enemy has put a nest in there and says, this will never going to happen. What are you hoping for? Alongside with this, I also would like to ask people again. I know there were a few people last week that felt the urge to come forward and they still resisted, which is okay. God hasn't got given up. I also would like to say if anyone is there that has missed last Sunday, if you want to overcome that fear that has been driving you, that has been taking your joy, that has been taking your hope, that has been taking your faith, I also invite you to come forward. But everyone that has lost hope, I ask you, I ask everyone to stand anyway. But I just ask you to reflect. And if you feel like God is pulling you and you need a breakthrough, I just invite you to come forward. Because there is power in that. There is power in standing up and saying no more. No more. Exactly like last week. No more. We will not allow the enemy to take our courage. And we also will not allow him to take our hope. Because as we have seen, this is very, very essential in our Christian life and in our circumstances. And you might feel that you have hit the wall too many times. You feel like you're hitting your head against the wall. And that's for you. When you feel that, I ask you to come forward. It doesn't matter what anyone thinks. And if you feel like Standing in the pew, that's fine too. But I just ask you to open yourself up to not myself, but Jesus. Because he wants it to change. He wants you to have hope in every circumstance of your life. Hope for your health, hope for your future, hope for your finances, hope for that he hasn't forgotten you, that he's always going to be with you, Hope that that life would change that is close to you and your family. And if anyone feels like it, please come forward. Because that is an act of faith. That is showing the enemy, I don't want it. 
I need hope. See, the awesome thing is with Jesus, he has never lost hope in us. See, that's where it's so different. Where we sometimes throw, throw the tools or throw it in the dirt, you know, our plans, our, our dreams, our, our desires, we throw them away. Jesus says, I have never lost my hope in you. Till the very, very end of your circumstance, till the very, very end of your life, I have hope in you, that you will come to me, that you will know me. That's the difference. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your hope. Lord Jesus, we give you our heart where we have let go of that hope in regards to us, in regards to our life, our family, our kids, our friends, our work. We also give you our heart when it comes to salvation. When we look into the future and we, we are afraid or we are nervous or we are wondering and we just ask you, Lord, let your hope burn in our hearts, in our relationship with you. Lord, we give you our minds where there's a nest of lies, a spider web of lies, that we will be lonely, that we are forgotten, that nobody cares about us, that it's never going to change. We give you that right now. We release that into your hand. We said, Lord, take it. Take it from me. For your burden is light and your yoke is easy. And we say, Lord, I have hope again. And speak that out into your heart. I have hope again for this person. I have hope again for my marriage. I have hope again for my spouse. I have hope again for my relationship with you. I have hope again for my future, for my kid, for my work. And just speak that forth. Holy Spirit, I ask you that you would move on every heart and every mind, that you would liberate them from the lies, that you would liberate them from the unbelief or where the hope has been lost, because you are our only hope. You work within us. Have your way in our lives. Have your way in this church. If there's anyone else that feels like to come forward that has lost hope, even a person that I feel like if there's anyone that has lost hope in physical healing and you want to have prayer, now is the time. any break, breakthrough, any mental things, any, anything that has been tormenting you, come forward and we as a church will pray with you.